The Morgan Report with David Morgan. David Morgan with you with the weekly perspective for the week ending December 15th, 2017. First up, Zero Hedge. Title, How GDP Became a Joke in One Chart. Article starts off the chart showing, excluding energy, the underlying U.S. growth has been slowing down. Very interesting chart, suggest you read the whole article. I'd like to further talk about uh, in this article, by the way of context, recall what Peter Donovan had to say. He makes the point that they have repeatedly underscored over the past decade, namely that economic data is largely worthless and any instant snapshot reveals more about the political and goal-seeking excuse me goal seeking climate of the agency releasing the quote unquote data than about the underlying economy itself and i'll just add anyone listening to this channel already knows that but we constantly see things from the mainstream press that indicate that everything's wonderful everything's good gdp growth is great and the real facts are it's not the case Next article is from The Guardian. I'll just read the headline. It says everything. The world's richest 0.1% have boosted their wealth by as much as the poorest half. Inequality report also shows that the United Kingdom's 50,000 richest people have seen their share of the country's wealth double since 1984. Obviously, this wealth discrepancy continues, and it has many people upset. And what we've seen from history is these kind of large discrepancies usually lead to some type of revolutionary act at some point. Next up, my favorite topic always in that's the debt markets. This is from Bloomberg. Bond markets really are signaling a slowdown. Bloomberg. When it comes to economic outlook, the bond market is smarter than the stock market. That Wall Street adage appears to be on the money from a cyclical vantage point with key indicators in the fixed income markets independently collaborating slowdown signals from the Economic Cycle Research Institute's leading indexes. The yield curve is widely considered to be among the most prescient indicators. That's why its flattening this year has been troublesome for an otherwise optimistic consensus to explain away. This hasn't stopped optimistic analysts from dismissing the yield curve's message on the grounds that inflation expectations have been declining in recent years or that foreign central banks like the ECB and the Bank of Japan continue to artificially suppress their bond yields, pulling down U.S. yields. We're reminded of Sir John Templeton's warning that this time it's different are the four most costly words in the annals of investing. But that's effectively what it means to simply ignore the slowdown signals emanating from the fixed income markets. So I won't add anything here. You hear it almost every week from me. It's the most important market of all is the debt markets, what the bond markets are doing. And at some point, this situation cannot do anything except reach reality, which means interest rates will go up and bond prices will fall. And as some of you know, I am in Mexico for almost two and a half weeks. This fits right together. This is an article from Reuters. The title is, Mexican authorities warn cryptocurrency offerings could be a crime. Mexico's finance ministry and central bank warned on Wednesday that cryptocurrencies were risky investments and said fundraising programs known as ICOs or initial coin offerings could potentially violate Mexican financial law. Amid the growing popularity of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, the authorities together with the banking and securities regulator CNBV said in a statement, such currencies are not officially recognized in Mexico as a legal form of payment. To date, there have been no ICO offerings originating in Mexico, the statement said. Quote, however, depending on the specific characteristics, Some ICOs that originate and are admitted in Mexico could violate the market securities law and constitute a financial crime, end quote, said the authorities. And moving on to the Asian Review, which we've quoted in the past, 
This headline reads, South Korea says no to miners trading cryptocurrencies. Seoul, South Korea will introduce measures to curb criminal activity and overheated speculation related to cryptocurrencies, including a ban on miners and non-residents from setting up trading accounts and a ban on banks from holding or accepting such currencies as security for financial transactions. The Prime Minister's Secretariat said Wednesday that the new rules are aimed at protecting holders of virtual currencies from cyber crimes and at cooling speculation. And from Ars Seneca, this headline from Altcoins is, Leading Cryptocurrency Exchange Faces Outages as Bitcoin Rivals Surge. This month's cryptocurrency boom isn't limited to Bitcoin. Over the last 24 hours, this is written late in the week, two of Bitcoin's largest rivals, Litecoin and Ethereum, have enjoyed huge price gains. Trading volume has been so intense that one of the leading cryptocurrency exchange services, Coinbase, has suffered a downtime. Ethereum buys and sells are temporarily disabled, re disabled ready notice on the Coinbase status page around 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That issues were resolved around 45 minutes later, while trading in Litecoins was disabled for about 90 minutes earlier in the day. That's about all the time I'm going to take on the cryptos this week. Next article up, it's two things that I have made important uh, on these weekly perspectives, and that one is energy and, of course, cybersecurity. This is from oilprice.com, and the headline reads, The oil and gas industry is under attack. Almost two-thirds of oil and gas companies have recently had serious cyber security incidents, and only a small minority of them felt confident that their defense capabilities match the threats. A new survey has revealed. The survey, which involved 40 respondents from the oil and gas industry, found that 60% had recently had significant cybersecurity incidents, but only 15% have what the survey called a robust incident response program. Even more discouraging was the finding that just 17% of respondents felt they were very likely to detect a sophisticated cyber attack in the future. So again, I've talked about the cybersecurity in the crypto space, but it really is web-wide. Anything to do with the Internet or connectivity, the Internet of Things or all that has serious cybersecurity issues, and it's not me saying this. This is the top of the pyramid types that run some of these most sophisticated companies in AI, et cetera, have talked about the one part of it that they are concerned about is security, something to consider. And the next article is from Reuters. Headline reads, Hackers Halt Plant Operations in Watershed Cyber Attack. The article goes on that the authorities declined to identify the victim, the industry, or the location of the attack, but they did say hackers targeted an organization in the Middle East and that it believed the victim was in Saudi Arabia. It's a rather vague article, but they don't want to compromise too much information. It's obvious, though, that this is a uh, rather big concern to those that were involved. The article concludes that the attackers were likely conducting reconnaissance to learn how they could modify safety systems so it would uh, not operate in the event that hackers intended to launch an attack that disrupted or damaged a plant. Reminds me of the Sexnet virus that uh, most of us that are awake and aware are most uh, aware of what took place and probably who did it and what the consequences were. And I'll go ahead and conclude with the gold and silver markets that I do almost every week. Not really much to be said. There's only two more weeks of trading. It looks to me from the recent action that the bottom is probably in or close to it for both the metals. Uh, silver has rallied slightly above the $16 level. Gold is still meandering around the $12.60 or so. Shrugged off the instant, instant, excuse me, interest rate rise and all appears to be in a position where I've told the members and those that listen to these perspectives that it's a good time to accumulate. If it's only for a trade, it could be longer than that. Obviously, there's two perspectives, one shorter term than the other. Regardless, we usually get a good rally into the first quarter of the new year. I fully expect that to be the place to be for at least the first quarter. The commitment of traders' perspective changed significantly over the last few uh, reporting periods and continue to build in a positive way, which means 
that is to the advantage to be long from this point forward. You don't need to be too anxious for it, but I'm certain that we'll see some good uh, returns in the first quarter of the new year. And that will conclude this week's weekly perspective. Remember, there's nothing more powerful than the truth.